All right, guys, how's it going? I, um, yeah, I'm here to talk to you a little about DNA discovery and structure. I'm not going to make videos for everything uh, for when I'm out, but they're just some concepts that's just a little bit easier if I explain because there's stories that go with them and, you know, all that good stuff like that. So, you know, I could be having a baby right now. Who knows? So, um, yay. All right, let's talk about DNA discovery and structure, please. All right. So um, you guys have a review chart up at the top of your notes. Um, if you guys could, why don't you take a few to fill in what you remember. So I'm asking you about the nucleus, I'm asking you about DNA, and I'm also asking you about the nucleolus. Now, if you don't know what it means, you got to look back at your old notes, okay? And I'm actually going to encourage you guys to do that. And um, if Ms. Hartstock could, she's going to hit pause on this video to give you guys a little bit of time um, to look that up because it is good to go back and review. All right, so take a few to do that, please. All right, finding all of those things, or actually you didn't even have to look it up because you just remember. Let's review what these things do. All right, first and foremost, uh, the nucleus is the control center of the cell. This is where we're going to find the DNA. All right, so it's the control center of the cell where we're going to find DNA. Now, who should you have had check marks beside on some of that stuff? And actually, I'm going to go through this part a little bit fast. Okay, pretty much it's only going to be found in animal and plant cells. So you should have a check mark by animal and plant cells, not by prokaryotic. All right, so let's talk about DNA. DNA, and just write what is underlined here. This was a slide that I gave you guys back for characteristics of life. Um, it's an organism's genetic makeup. Okay, um, we talked about this a little bit back in biochem as well, and obviously we're going to hit it pretty hard here. But what I mean by genetic makeup is basically it's a blueprint for makes us who and what we are. And if you look at this guy, he's obviously very unique. He has some pretty interesting DNA. All right. Uh, who has DNA? Hopefully you guys remember that that is a characteristic of life. Every single living thing is going to have this. So that includes prokaryotic check, animal check, plant check. All right. Very last one is going to be your nucleolus. Nucleolus, this is where we're going to make the ribosomes. It's not really going to be much about what we're going to talk about today, but it will show up when we discuss protein synthesis. So it's this darker circle that's actually going to be inside of the nucleus, kind of like the yolk, I guess you can say. All right, now who's going to have a nucleolus? It's going to be found in only in animal and plant cells. That is it, okay? All right, so nice little review. Woohoo! Let's move on. All right. So <clears throat> you guys have this little diagram in your notes. It's pretty lovely. Um, you should be noticing that I'm using the same cell here because, you know, we learned all the parts and we're kind of zooming into different parts. So structures and components of the nucleus. Um, obviously, what we have right here, this is going to be our nucleus, the great big huge circle right there. So if, again, you guys could label that in your notes. Okay, good old nucleus. Again, has that little yolk inside of it. All right, so what is all that squiggle stuff that you see inside of there? That is actually going to be the DNA, all right? <clears throat> so DNA is a great big, huge, massive mess, I guess you can say. And um, it's actually called chromatin, and that is something that's going to show up a little bit later on. But the DNA is inside of the nucleus, all right? And then what we have here is we got our nucleolus inside of there as well. Just kind of FYI, a little bit of a review, okay? And um, yoo-hoo, all right? Sounds good. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what DNA is. Now, what does DNA stand for? DNA stands for deoxyribonucleic acid, all right? And I know it's a little distracting, this thing just spinning around like this. Um, you're never going to have to spit out deoxyribonucleic acid, but I feel like if I'm going to give you abbreviations for something, you should have an idea of what it stands for. And who knows? This could be like some big question that you get one day if you're on Jeopardy or something like that. Oops, excuse me, adjusting. Um, and you, you could get it right. And then you give me a cut of all your winnings because I'm the one that taught you this, right? So deoxyribonucleic acid. All right, and the key thing here, guys, N-A, N-A, nucleic acid, nucleic acid. All right, and that was on your wake up. All right, so um, where are we? And if you guys remember, I love doing this just because I feel as if I feel that you're with me, but then when we have conversations or I kind of see what you write, you're not really with me. So I just kind of want to do this little zoom in window with you guys. Okay, here's this lovely individual right here. You see his hand. Let's zoom on in. 
okay? So we have right here is we got skin, okay? Skin is actually going to be a tissue, all right, that is going to be made up of cells, okay? So if you notice, again, lots of cells, we are multicellular. Similar cells make up the skin. So let's zoom in into one single cell, all right? Who cares about that? Yay, got it right. Okay, um, we got a little organelles, those look like mitochondria, maybe a little lysosome or a vacuole. We care about the nucleus, so let's zoom into the nucleus. Okay, notice again you got all those little pores, the nucleus kind of looks like a golf ball, kind of cool stuff. All those little squiggles inside of there is going to be your DNA. Let's zoom in there, okay? This is what DNA actually looks like. Not that you guys know that just yet, but you will, okay? But let's zoom in. All right, and this kind of looks a little bit like our diagram, but actually if we were to zoom in a little bit more, this looks like that little spinny thing that I had for you guys, okay? So again, that's looking at the molecular structure. This is just looking at a very simple band. This is what the DNA looks like when it's all coiled up. This is it inside of the nucleus, inside of the cell, yes, that make up a bunch of cells that make up our skin that make up this boy. Okay, so whoop, we are there. Okay, so um, hopefully you guys remember that we have um, nucleic acids, what we're talking about, and they're monomers that make that up. So actually what I want you guys to do in your notes is I want you to circle nucleotide right here. Do you see where you have structure of nucleotide? Circle that and draw a little arrow off to the side. So you're going to circle nucleotide, draw an arrow out to the side, and I want you to write monomer, monomer, okay? So circle nucleotide monomer. So the nucleotide is a monomer of DNA, okay? Which is a nucleic acid. So you guys have this little diagram up here. Let's go ahead and label what's what with that. Okay. All right. First thing that we have here is a number one. Now, what I want you guys to do is if you could put a number one in that circle right there, and if you look off to the side right there, you should have a space where I have a number one. Okay. You can label in two places, but I'd rather you not cram everything by this diagram. All right. So let's put a number one right there. And then off to the side, let's write phosphate. That is the phosphate group. If you remember, P is the unique thing that your nucleic acids are going to have. Okay. This little pentagon looking thing right here, this is going to be our sugar, okay? We call it specifically deoxyribose. So let's put a number two in this little shape right here. Off by number two, let's write deoxyribose. And actually, if you guys could, maybe in parentheses, write down sugar. So beside deoxyribose, have parentheses and write down sugar, all right? Because that's what it is. So we have phosphate, we have deoxyribose, and then we got this guy right here, okay? What this guy is, this is going to be number three, okay? And what number three is, is number three is going to be our nitrogen base, all right? So let's put a number three in that little rectangle there, and then off to the side, let's write down by the number three that it is a nitrogen base. So again, to show our elements, here we're going to have CHO, here we're going to have CHO and P, my cat's being bad. And then over here, this is where our end's going to come in. Okay? All right, now we have several different nitrogen bases. All right, the first one is something called adenine. So under A, let's write the word adenine. Now you're never really going to have to spit that out for me again, so let's just go ahead and write it down for this one time. And then off in parentheses, why don't you guys put the letter A beside that. All right, so adenine is A. All right? B is going to be something called thymine. Okay, so let's write down thymine, and beside thymine, let's put um, a T beside that. So we have A and T right now. So adenine and thymine. Okay, next we are going to have C, which is cytosine. Cytosine is going to be C, all right? So cytosine is going to be C, weird one to say. Again, you're not going to have to say these again, but you need to be able to recognize them. I'm never going to have you spell them out. Okay, and the last one's probably the weirdest one, that's D. We're going to call this guanine. Okay, so we have guanine. Let's put a little G beside that one, please. All right, so we have adenine A, thymine T, cytosine C, and guanine G. All right, these are our four nitrogen bases. So to kind of explain how that works is I can have one nucleotide that has a phosphate, deoxyribose, and guanine. I can have another nucleotide that is phosphate, deoxyribose, and thymine. Okay, so these four right here are going to vary. You're only going to have one here 
at a time. Okay, they'll never all four be there. It's just one at a time. Okay, all right. So pretty much what I covered right there, guys, is what we knew about DNA way, 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 way long, long time ago. Okay, these are the things that we knew. So we're gonna have a little bit of a history lesson. Okay, so biologists were aware of the monomer structure of DNA. Again, what we just reviewed, but we had no idea what the actual shape of it was. And a lot of you guys are like, "Who cares? Big whoop! I don't. You know, who, who, what does it matter?" It was a, it mattered tremendously, all right. And the reason why it did matter tremendously is because um, it could help explain what how DNA works and how does it do what it needs to do. Now, I have right here that it got crazy, and the reason why I say it got crazy is because a lot of scientists wanted to be the first one to get credit for discovering the shape of DNA. So we started to notice weird stuff happening, all this competition happening at the same time. Okay, all right. So let's talk about how this happened. All right, first guy that we're going to discuss, and imagine that all these things are kind of going a little bit simultaneously, not so much, okay? We're going to talk about a guy named um, Shargaff. I don't care about his first name, just know his last name, okay? What Shargaff did is that he actually spent the majority of his time looking at the nitrogen bases, okay? He didn't care so much about the sugar or the phosphate. He's like, I want to know what's going on with these bases because we got four of them, what's happening? All right, so he spent time examining the nitrogen bases of several different organisms, all right? And again, how you do this is you can extract DNA from things and, and do all sorts of fun stuff with it. We won't get into the how, okay? So what he came up with in this is that he came up with something known as Shargaff's Rule, all right? And what Shargaff's Rule basically said was that he found that in examining these different bases and all these different organisms, that there are equal amounts of the A and the T, okay, equal amounts of A and T, and also equal amounts of G and C. So kind of what you see right here, and you guys don't have to write down adenine, thymine, you're more than welcome to say, found equal amounts of A and T, and equal amounts of G and C. Or you can just say A equals T, G equals C. That's kind of an easy way to write that. Okay, this was huge, okay? So if there's equal amounts of them, that means that they gotta have some type of relationship with each other, okay? Some type of crazy relationship, all right? So to kind of show you, not that it really matters, but for me it helps to visualize it, okay? Some of his actual findings in several different organisms. If you check out this one right here, um, for example, Homo sapiens, that's us, okay? So we have about 31% um, of A and T and about 19% of G and C. And notice it's not perfect, but it's pretty close. This Drosophila melagaster, melanogaster, that's your fruit fly. Okay, that's what you get all that's really annoying in the summertime around your fruits. Okay, they have about 27 and 22. All right, and notice it's different for every organism. The ZMAs, this is corn. Okay, again, you can kind of see. And then these guys down here will hop to these bottom two. That's E. coli. You guys have heard of that one. That's a bacteria. And this one's bacteria as well. Okay, so just to show you that it varies from organism to organism, but if we were to look at these numbers, they're about the same. Okay, so there's got to be some relationship between those bases. All right, so let's talk about um, Rosalind Franklin. And I have Wilkins up there. I don't really care about him so much. She's kind of the lady of the hour. Um, she actually decided to look at DNA in a different way that nobody had. And she says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to extract DNA from an organism. And, you know, remember, every living thing has DNA, so it's the same, okay? It should have the same structure. She decided to crystallize it, okay? Turn it into a crystal. And once she turned it into a crystal, she says, I'm going to shoot an x-ray of it. Done, okay? Um, again, hadn't been done before. All right, so she got the DNA, crystallized it, and then took an x-ray of it. And what was really cool about that is that she found that DNA had an X pattern, okay? Now, and again, I know you guys are like, big whoop, but these were huge discoveries made at this time, okay? And again, everybody was fighting to get to become the, the researching frantically to become the first people to get credit for that, the shape of DNA. Okay, so with the X pattern, this is an actual picture of her x-ray right here, okay? And with this X, she's thinking, okay, well, maybe there's two sides to DNA. I don't really 
actually know. It kind of looks a little crazy. It was kind of like, I don't know if you guys have ever gotten like a piece of research for um, a research paper or something, or you're trying to figure something out, and you read one article or one statement where you're like, okay, I kind of get that, but I don't quite get it. Okay, that was her. She looks at this and she's like, I have some ideas where basically DNA could have this weird shape like this, but again, I'm not so sure. Okay, here's where the drama unfolds. All right, so she had her x-ray picture and um, she didn't want anybody else to see it because who knows, one person could see this and be like, pow, I got it. I know what shape DNA is, okay? She wanted to be the one to figure it out. Well, what stinks is these next guys that you have in your notes, Watson and Crick, they actually somehow got their hands on Sorry, I thought my I got cats driving me crazy. They somehow found that they got their hands on this x-ray, okay? They got their hands on it. And what sucks about that is all they had to do was look at it once, and with all of the research that they had been doing, pow, they knew the shape of DNA, okay? So the sad part of this story is that there's a gentleman, two gentlemen by the name of Watson and Crick, okay? They use their own data, and notice I say information collected by other scientists. I heard that they broke into lab, her lab, and stole it, stole, stole it nice, took it, and it basically allowed them to get credit for the shape of DNA, okay? So the main thing you need to put by these guys is put down, uh, discovered the shape of DNA. They got credit for it. All right. One of these guys actually works at UNC Chapel Hill is from what I heard. I can't really ever remember which one it is. And I heard he's just kind of a cranky old man. All right. So they use their own data and information collected by other scientists to discover the shape of DNA. So these guys ended up winning uh, a peace prize for it. Um, and poor Rosalind Franklin didn't get a whole lot of credit for anything that she did. She did, however, years, 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 years after she passed away. Um, everybody's like, hey, Rosalind, props, you took that x-ray, which helped these guys. If they didn't see that x-ray, they wouldn't have known. Okay, kind of a sad story, but they get credit for it. Okay, so here's them working hard in the lab, and I got a little video I'm going to show you here in a second that kind of talks about how they did that. Here's them showing how they got the x-ray and figured out what was going on here. I know all this looks like Greek to you guys. But um, we're going to talk a little bit about what that shape is, okay? They wrote a book called The Double, the Double Helix. They won a Nobel Peace Prize uh, for that. And um, I've never actually read this, which is probably embarrassing for me to say as a, the, you know, a scientist. But um, I've tried to read it, and it's a little bit of a tough read. And this is a very um, lovely picture of them, okay? All right, so um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you guys a video um, about this. Um, Ms. Hartsock, you need to plug in the, um, the speakers, okay? And let's watch this. Some parts of it are not that exciting, but at the same time, you can kind of hear their story about, don't download, about how they did this. And this is actually, whoops, a video that we are going to watch all of throughout the course of the semester, okay? So when do I need to stop it again? Sorry, everybody. 9.36. And Ms. Um, Hartsock, if you want to give them a break before you start this, because I know they get a little impatient, um, feel free to pause this video and let them stretch for about two minutes. It's your call. Um, and then um, we'll pick up from there, okay? All right, go ahead and hit pause if you'd like, or let's just go on through. Hello. <laughs> There is a common thread running through all of life. The thread is an incredibly long molecule that carries all of evolutionary history along its length. It is inside every cell of every living thing, from the smallest creature to the very largest. 
The secret of life is a molecule called DNA. If we could magnify DNA 10 million times, this is what it would look like. The latest computer animations enable us to see how it is intricately wrapped up inside each of our cells like a thousand mile long strand of spaghetti. A thousand mile strand long strand of spaghetti. That's in that tiny little nucleus. How cool is that? All right, so, and that's in a microscopic cell. If you guys think back to your animal plant cell lab where you looked at your cheek cell and you saw that tiny little dot, all that is crammed into that tiny little thing. Pretty cool. The idea that a single molecule could contain all the instructions to build every living thing shocked the world when it was first realized 50 years ago. It's still an astonishing concept today. How is it possible? Hidden within these coils is a code that, once broken, would reveal the secret of life. There were not many clues. When scientists looked down a microscope, all they could see were the chromosomes big bundles of DNA that become visible as the cell divides. They could see the complexity of the developing organism, but what was controlling it? How were life's instructions written in the DNA? It was the greatest question in biology. Every cell in this juggler's body is programmed by her DNA code. We can begin to understand DNA's role in shaping even the most complex biological systems by looking at our own attempts to reproduce reality. A programmer can accurately simulate the action of the juggler using computer software. Our artificial juggler never drops a ball unless the software engineer programs her to do so. Such simulations are built up from thousands of lines of computer code, precise instructions that determine how the 3D model should behave. The computer acts on the instructions by turning on and off millions of microscopic switches that direct the flow of signals around its circuits. There is a similar kind of software working inside everything that is alive. It is based on the DNA molecule. Instead of binary ones and zeros used by computers, Biological software works on four letters, A, C, G, and T. These are the four chemical building blocks of the DNA molecule. They are made of nucleic acid, which gives DNA its tongue-twisting full name, deoxyribonucleic acid. The big Okay, so that was getting ready. We're going to get into the getting getting ready. That's everything that we knew. Now we're going to get into the history of it a little bit, okay? The facing scientists 50 years ago was how these building blocks fitted together. If they could discover the chemical structure of this gooey, mysterious substance, it might provide clues which would explain how DNA controlled life. The scientists working on the problem were on the verge of making one of the greatest discoveries of the 20th century. Their names, Francis Crick and Jim Watson. It's the same picture. This unlikely duo, working in Cambridge, England, became obsessed with the problem.
Crick was a fast-talking British physicist who loved chasing new ideas. Watson was a precocious American biologist with laser-sharp focus. When Watson caught a sneak preview of an unpublished picture of DNA from... Notice it said undisclosed sneak preview of a picture of DNA. Just had to point that out. Had to point it out. Rosalind, sorry, honey. Stray studies done by Rosalind Franklin in London. He realized immediately the molecule must have a spiral shape. Back in Cambridge... Watson was desperate to explore DNA's 3D structure by building models. One Saturday morning in the spring of 1953, he rushed into the Cavendish laboratory, eager to start work. The Cavendish shop was to build us some tin models, and that took too long. And, uh, you know, finally in desperation, I made some out of cardboard. I began moving them around, and I wanted an arrangement, you know, where I had a big and a small molecule, and uh, so how did you do it? Somehow you had to, to form link bonds. So uh, here's uh, A, and here's T, and uh, I wanted this hydrogen to point directly at this nitrogen. So I had something like this. Oh. So then I went to the, the pair and wanted this nitrogen to point to this one. I went like this. Whoa, they look the same. And you can put one right on top of the other. We knew we could just, you know, even if we go up to the ceiling, we're building a tiny fraction of the molecule. Hundreds of million of these base pairs in one molecule, all fitting into this wonderful symmetry in which we saw, you know, the morning of February 28th, uh, 1953. It isn't that it looks so beautiful, it's the idea, I think, the structure and what it does, which is because of its beauty, its simplicity, that's really, really what uh, makes people say it's beautiful, which I think is the right word. And it was very unexpected that it should be as simple and as striking as that. Hidden within the spiral molecule was a simple pattern that enabled Watson and Crick to understand the chemical basis of life. Untwist the spiral, and DNA can be seen as two parallel strands. Which is what we're about That's to do. That's why it's sometimes called the double helix. Unzip the strands, and you have two linear sequences of the letters A, C, G, and T. The precise order of the letters along the molecule carries the coded instructions. Notice here, we could, we're applying Shargaff's rule, and we're going to get to this here in a second. If you remember, Shargaff found that there are equal amounts of C and G and A and T. Notice, wherever there's a T, I'm going to have an A attached to it. A, T, C, G, G, C, G, C, okay? We call this base pairing, all right? And that's all because of Shargaff's rule. And actually, this is some of my kids' most favorite stuff because it's pretty easy to grasp, okay? All right. These are the equivalent of binary ones and zeros in a computer. One strand is like a mirror image of the other. An A always pairs with a T and a C with a G. There you go, Shargaff. So if you know the sequence of one strand, you can work out the sequence of the other. It dawned on Watson and Crick that this mirror copy of the code was the key to understanding how the genetic information could be passed on. So the essence of life could be explained with chemistry. There were no mysterious life forces. Everything has molecules. There's nothing but molecules. 
self-organized in some way with instructions passed on from one generation to another. I think this is, you know, what uh, uh, Francis Crick and I felt, you know, when we saw the DNA structure. I'm going to stop right there, all right? And, um, yeah, there you go, all right? So, um, Miss Hartsock, if you would like to give them another break, I know that was a lot to take in. Feel free to pause this video again and um, let them stretch a little bit, shake it off, and we're almost done with our notes, okay? All right, go ahead and pause, or we can cruise on through. All right. So, the video covered a lot of that stuff. You saw some of the drama. You met the guys, heard them talk. Good times, okay? Let's talk a little bit about the structure of DNA, okay? Um, I think in your notes you guys have AKA. If you guys remember in the video, they call it the double helix, okay? So go ahead and label that as the um, double helix. Part, excuse me. Part of the reason is because it is double-sided, okay? DNA is the double helix, and helix is just like a twisted ladder. Now, if you guys notice, this is the twisted ladder. What I'm going to do is similar to what they did in the video is I'm going to squish it. So imagine I said, snack, okay, and flatten that baby out because it's a little bit easier to visualize what's happening with that, okay? All right, in your notes, um, you notice right here it might be a light. It's not red. I think it's like a gray. Let's put a box around that part right there. Okay, and circle nucleotide. If you can't see that it says nucleotide, let's write nucleotide right there. Okay, so remember that nucleotides are what we talked about at the beginning of the notes. You labeled it on the front part where it was the phosphate, deoxyribose, and the nucleotide. They are the monomers that make up DNA. Okay, so how many nucleotides do you guys see here? Can you count them? Try to count them. All right, so what number did we get? Did we get six? Oh yeah. Okay. So here's one, two, three, four, five, and six. Okay. So six nucleotides. All right. So let's go ahead and label some of these components. Okay. Right here. Um, again, compare them to the shapes that you guys had in the front of your notes. We have deoxyribose. Okay, deoxyribose are all these little pentagon things that you see basically um, making up the sides, okay? The circles are going to be your phosphate, okay? So phosphates are all these little circles, okay? Those are the circles, and I hope I did this. I did, okay? Let's put a big square around that part right there. Um, that's not a square. That's a rectangle, and it goes on both sides, all right? These are the handles, Okay, think of the handles to a ladder. Think of DNA as a, as a ladder, all right, a twisted ladder, but we flattened it out. We also refer to it as the DNA backbone oftentimes, okay? What you're going to see a little bit later on is that we're just simply going to be representing it with a line sometimes because, you know, we know what it is. They're the backbone. It's important. They keep it together. But what really determines what's happening is these guys right smack dab in the middle, and hopefully you recall hearing that in the video. It's the pattern, and it's the pattern of these guys that determine what our genetic makeup is, okay? All right, well, let's hop to those guys right there, okay? Right here, we're going to have our nitrogen bases, okay? So, again, if you notice that C base pairs with a G, base pairs just means that they come together, okay? What is that bond that holds them together? We refer to it as a hydrogen bond, okay? Now, we didn't get into a lot of bonding. We don't get into a lot of the chemistry, but just between us, I think I heard from somebody that they talked about this on the EOC, okay? Um, not quite sure why, because it's not in the curriculum. But um, hydrogen bonds are going to be the bonds that are going to hold these things together. So you're going to hear me bring it up, okay? Shh, don't tell anybody. All right? So those are our bases, okay? All right? So these guys right here, we call them the steps, Okay, oftentimes some people might call them the rungs as well, which is weird. And actually, I'm going to add that because I'm crazy like that. Steps slash rungs. Okay, I believe that's right. Okay, oh man. Okay, so these are the steps of the ladder and those will always be our bases. Okay, all right, so that's what DNA looks like, fairly simple. And I'm going to ask you this 80,000 times. You're going to draw 80,000 nucleotides. You're going to get over it, okay? 
All right, so matching strands of DNA. Let's play a little bit with that, okay? Notice here that I say that remember that A base pairs with T and G base pairs with C, meaning that they're just going to come together, okay? Um, so let's play together. Again, this dark line right here is the DNA backbone. That's the sugar and the phosphate. I'm going to represent it like that because, you know, we don't really care. We care, but not really. It's these guys that we care about, okay? So A likes T, okay? And I think the second one, T likes A. Why don't you guys take a few to finish it, okay? Continue on. Give you a few. Like I say, kids really like this stuff because it's pretty straight up. It's pretty straight up. And you can come up with a little hint for this one. Just kind of FYI, and I know you guys are probably ready for me to shut up. Um, when I have this, this is totally my family, which I think is awesome. I have two brothers named Adam and Toby. Okay, Adam and Toby are my two older brothers, and they're like best buddies. And then I'm Carrie. That's my name. And my mom's name is Gail, and my mom and I are really tight, too. Now, my poor papa, he's he got along with everybody, okay? But um, this group is super tight, okay? So Gail and Carrie and Adam and Toby, wacky, all right? Oh, that stinks. Here, let's see your results. <laughs> I can fix this. Hold on, guys. Got to be smarter than the PowerPoint. Let's move it. Why did I not do this? Well, you can watch me do this. Why did it not disappear? All right, here we go. Bop, bop, bop. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, does that look good? Check your work. Pretty easy. Kind of fun. A little mindless. Um, but good times. All right. Okay. So with that said and done, I'm going to let Ms. Hartsock take over. Um, and, um, yeah, you guys are going to, you're going to not get videos for everything now that I'm gone, but just kind of the more difficult things that I need to ramble on and on and on and on about. Not saying that Miss Hartsock couldn't hang with it because she could. Um, but I just, um, you know, some of my favorite things. So especially this unit, there's some pretty important things that we need to talk about. Okay. Uh, behave. I miss you guys. Hope all's well. And, um, yeah, I'll be in touch. All right. See you later.